Hey there, it's Kenny. Today we're going to talk about two historical mysteries surrounding Zhang Xinjiang, one of the leaders of the peasant uprisings at the end of the Ming Dynasty. First up, did he leave behind a treasure for us to discover? And secondly, did he really carry out mass killings of civilians in Xichun? So, buckle up and get ready for an adventure through history as we try to unravel the mysteries surrounding Zhang Xinjiang. Let me tell you more about Zhang Xinjiang, one of the leaders of the peasant uprisings at the end of the Ming Dynasty. He's up there with Li Jiqing in terms of notoriety, and he's the guy who founded the Daoxi regime. Zhang grew up in a poor family, but he was a clever and stubborn kid. He helped his dad sell red dates, but eventually became a constable and then a border soldier. Zhang was a tough guy who loved to stand up for the little guy, even if it meant risking his life. During the reign of Ming Emperor Chongzhen, he captured Wu Cheng and declared himself the King of Dashi. The following year, he invaded Xichun and established the Dashi regime in Chengdu. Unfortunately, he died fighting against the Qing army later on. Some people believe that Zhang was an important leader of the People's Uprising at the end of the Ming Dynasty. His army was successful in battle and he was a key figure in overthrowing the rule of Emperor Chongzhen. He was also a major support for Li Jicheng after his defeat. However, others think that Zhang was a bloodthirsty monster who enjoyed killing people. He ruled over Xichun without bringing any benefits to any social class. His brutal nature was a major reason why Xichun became even more devastated during the continuous wars. Now, I am going to talk about two historical mysteries surrounding Zhang Xinjiang. Have you heard of the legend of the treasure of Zhang Xinjiang? According to the legend, at the end of the Ming Dynasty, Zhang Xinjiang established the Dashi Kingdom in Xichun, proclaimed himself emperor, and after being defeated in battle, he transported numerous gold and silver treasures on a ship, which was attacked at Pengshan, and the entire treasure ship sank. This treasure is said to rank third on the United Nations list of mysterious treasures and is valued as the top treasure in Asia. And I can tell you, this legend is true. The story is that Zhang Xinjiang led his army out of Chengdu with a treasure trove of gold, silver, and jewels. They traveled downstream on the Min River but were ambushed by Ming army in Pengshan. The ship carrying the treasure sank giving rise to the legend of the Jiangku sunken silver. Fast forward to 2010, the Mation city government in Xichun province designated the Jiangku sunken silver site in Pengshan's Jiangku town as a municipal level cultural relic protection unit. In 2015, experts located the sunken ship site and successfully excavated it on a large scale in 2017. They uncovered many precious cultural relics, including gold and silver books that Zhang Xinjiang used to appoint his concubines, as well as gold and silver coins, rings, and weapons such as iron swords and knives. In 2022, a rescue excavation of the Ming Dynasty battlefield site in Pengshan's Jiangku revealed important findings. The excavation covered an area of 1,000 square meters and unearthed more than 10,000 cultural relics, including a large number of bronze weapons and tools dating from the Western Zhu period to the Warring States period. The types of bronze weapons include swords, triangular polearms, adzes, and chisels, with complete and well-preserved shapes. Some of the Western Jew bronze weapons found here have great significance for understanding the origin and development of Xichun bronze weapons. In addition, over 90,000 coins from various dynasties were also unearthed, from the Qin Dynasty's Ban Lang to the Republic of China's machine-made coins, covering more than 2,000 years of Xichun's coin casting and use. This has important value for the study of Xichun's economic history, currency casting history, and the history of navigation on the Min River. The excavation team also discovered a concentration of official silver and weapons from the Dashi Empire in the central northern part of the excavation area. The official silver discovered was mainly tax silver from the Zhang Xinjiang regime, originating from places around Chengdu. Archaeologists believe that these silver ingots were originally stored together and later sank during the Jiangku battle. On the eastern side of the official silver concentration area, the excavation team found a large number of weapons such as arrowheads, firearms, and lead bullets. The firearms included single-eye guns, three-eye guns, and hundred shotguns of different types. They also discovered partially melted gold and silver objects, providing strong evidence for the historical records of the use of fire attacks during the Jiangku battle. Therefore, it is speculated that this area is the site of the Jiangku battle, or very close to the site. 
The excavation's discoveries have made a significant breakthrough in defining the southern boundary of the Zhang Kuming Dynasty battlefield site and the protection and rescue of many precious cultural relics. Now, let's dive into the controversy surrounding Jiang Xinjiang's massacre of Xichun people. Some say that when Jiang Xinjiang marched into Xichun and established the Dashi regime, he faced strong resistance from the Ming loyalists in the region. As a result, he decided to retaliate with slaughter. Jiang Xinjiang allegedly killed men first and then forced women to jump into the river. According to historical records, the number of deaths was no less than 4 million. Some people believe that Jiang Xinjiang's massacred the people of Xichun. First of all, since Jiang needed a lot of supplies for his army, he had to steal food from the people of Xichun. And since Jiang liked killing people, he did so in a very brutal and violent way. Secondly, according to the history book written by the Jesuit priest Gabriel de Magalhães, who was a foreigner in China at the time, Zhang Xinjiang led a large army towards the provincial capital and killed people and burned everything in his path. He wanted to take over the city and declare himself the emperor of China, which is exactly what he did. As a result, many people had to flee and hide in the mountains to avoid his tyranny. The priest also said that Zhang used various forms of torture to kill countless people, such as beheading, skinning alive, and dismemberment. He even killed 140,000 Xichun soldiers. Therefore, the whole province was almost devoid of people. Since the foreigner's account is more objective, it's more believable. Thirdly, in 2014, some Xichun farmers accidentally discovered what appeared to be a human skull while working in the fields. In the local caves, there were also thousands of human bones piled up. According to the legends passed down from the elders in the village, Zhang Xinjiang went crazy after entering Xichun and killed people everywhere he went. However, some people doubt the claim that Jiang Xinjiang massacred the Xichun people. First of all, during the early days of the Dashi regime, Jiang Xinjiang gained considerable support. According to accounts by the missionaries Ladovico Buglio and Gabriel de Magalhães, he showed generosity and fairness, which won many hearts, including officials who followed him. From Jiang Xinjiang's subjective intention, his goal of entering Xichun was to take it as a base, allowing him to expand his power and influence. It's hard to imagine that he would slaughter the people while building his own country. Secondly, there are doubts about the legend of the seven kill steel in the Qing dynasty. The Qing government claimed that Zhang Xinjiang not only killed many people but also erected a steel in the place where he killed them. The steel with the following inscription, Heaven brings forth innumerable things to nurture man. Man has nothing good with which to recompense heaven. Kill, 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 kill. However, in 1934, a British missionary found a saintly decree steel that Jiang Xinjiang had erected in a public cemetery in Guanghan, Xichun. The inscription on the steel was a call for people to reflect on their actions and be kind to others with no hint of killing. It seems that the Qing government deliberately distorted the inscription to depict Jiang Xinjiang as a brutal killer. Thirdly, there is a Jiang Xinjiang ancestral temple in Xichun. According to local legends, during the Ming Dynasty, when the officials oppressed the people, Jiang Xinjiang led his troops to fight against the government. When he arrived in Xichun, he killed corrupt officials, opened granaries, and solved the long-standing food shortage problem for the people. Therefore, even though the Ming court sent a large army to surround and kill him, the people of Xichun still have respect for Jiang Xinjiang. If he had really slaughtered the people of Xichun, why would they still revere him to this day? Fourthly, the number of people recorded in the official history book compiled by the Qing dynasty contradicts the actual situation regarding Jiang Xinjiang's massacre of Xichun people. The History of Ming which was officially compiled by the Qing dynasty, claims that Jiang Xinjiang killed 600 million people in Xichun, a number that is obviously exaggerated. At that time, the total population of China was less than 100 million. This is a clear exaggeration. Moreover, the history of Ming has many inconsistencies. It first records that Xichun had a population of over 3 million, but later states that Jiang Xinjiang killed 600 million people in Xichun. While there were instances of peasant uprisings involving violent killings in history, it is unimaginable that Jiang Xinjiang could have killed almost all of the people in Xichun, leaving only 60,000 survivors. If Jiang Xinjiang had already killed almost all of Xichun's population before November 1646, why would the Qing army need to spend more than 10 years to pacify a region with no population left? And how could Xichun resist the Qing army for over a decade? My personal opinion is that Jiang Xinjiang had a clear tendency towards killing, which had an extremely negative impact on both his own rule and the overall anti-Qing resistance. However, many second-hand documents from the mid-Qing period tend to exaggerate 
and distort the facts. It's true that the population of Xichun experienced a sharp decline towards the end of the Ming and the beginning of the Qing dynasties. This can be attributed to a combination of factors, including the massacres and wars brought about by Zhang Xinjiang and the Qing dynasty, as well as the collapse of local administrative structures and resulting famine and tiger attacks. However, it's important to note that the Qing dynasty had a political agenda when it came to Zhang Xinjiang's reputation in Qichun. Many of the leaders of the Daoxi kingdom who came after Zhang Xinjiang were key players in the anti-Qing resistance, including his stepson Li Dingkuak and Liu Wenshou, who were highly respected among the local population. This posed a threat to the legitimacy of the Qing dynasty's rule, so they distorted and exaggerated the facts in order to tarnish the reputation of the Daoxi kingdom. Especially Zhang Xinjiang's stepson Li Dingkuak and Liu Wenshou, who were of great importance at the time. This also fits in with the perspective of some intellectuals who blame the downfall of the Ming Dynasty solely on bandits. It's important to take a critical look at historical documents and not accept everything at face value. And that's a wrap, folks. We've explored two intriguing mysteries surrounding Zhang Xinjiang, whether he left behind a treasure trove, and whether he was responsible for mass killings of civilians in Qichun. I hope you've enjoyed learning about these historical enigmas as much as I have. Before we go, I want to take a moment to thank you for watching this video. If you enjoyed it, please consider subscribing to my YouTube channel and liking this video. Your support means the world to me and motivates me to continue creating content about Chinese history, culture, and artifacts. And hey, if you have any suggestions for future topics you'd like me to cover, please leave a comment and let me know. I'm always open to feedback and would love to hear from you. Thanks again for tuning in, and I'll see you in my next video.